My name is Nick McSpadden. I'm the Client Systems Manager at Schools of Sacred Heart from San Francisco. Uh, we're a private school of about 1,000 students, 250 faculty and staff. I manage about 840 Macs, and right now about 208, 200 or so iPads. That's about to double because everyone's going down the let's double our iPad collection route this summer. And I'm sure many of you are also in a very similar boat. Uh, so this, this, uh, this whole conference is going to be a large exploration of how we can accommodate Apple's wonderful tools into their less than wonderful workflows. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> um, why do we use the command line? All right, because despite Apple's efforts to make a very easy to use interface, sometimes the interface is not very easy to use. Uh, not everything's immediately accessible. Not everything is intuitive. Sometimes it's just faster to open the terminal than it is to click and click and click a dozen times on the same spot in the screen. Um, for example, changing permissions and ownership of a file in the finder is kind of an obnoxious task. You have to get info, you have to move your mouse down to the little arrow for ownership permissions, click that, click the lock, authenticate, change permissions, save, hope it all applies, right? It's, it's kind of annoying if you have to do this a whole bunch of times. Instead, you can open the terminal and you can type in one line and you get the same result. So there are a lot of examples for which the interface just isn't very well suited to doing repetitive tasks. Um, the command line's a really good way to streamline some of this effort. There are tons, and I mean tons of websites and resources out there dedicated to explaining how to use the Bash shell, how to use the terminal. The Bash shell, it's old, it's classic, it's been very heavily documented, and you generally won't have any trouble finding advice or help. Um, IRC in particular is a really good resource. The Bash channel on Freenode uh, is full of really smart, often grumpy people who know all kinds of useful things about how to fix your problems. Um, the Mac Enterprise mailing list, if uh, I'm sure many of you are already on or familiar with, and if you're not, you very much should be. It's a great, fantastic set of people who can help you with uh, specifically Mac-related problems. Uh, the OSX server channel on Freenode as well is also full of most of the same people who are on the Mac Enterprise mailing list. Um, just about everything you can find that you need to know is online. Um, there are other resources, of course. There are ebooks, regular books, websites. I mentioned mailing lists and IRC. This link I've provided here on this slide, this is Apple's collection of documentation for just about everything they provide in command line form. Um, this is basically a large collection of all the manual pages, um, so you can find most of this on your workstation right now. Uh, but this is a really handy reference just to look for commands you may not even know exist. Uh, it's just a good way to discover new things that you might otherwise uh, be unable to find on your own. Um, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. All right, this is largely a collaborative process. We're all here together to learn and to help each other. In many cases, someone else on the internet has already solved your problem. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We're Mac admins, all right? We're celebrities, our time's extremely valuable, we're all really cool people. We don't wanna waste any of our time struggling to spin our wheels in the mud. We should instead waste someone else's time and have them do it for us. So, the command line. The traditional way to open it is, of course, through the terminal and the utilities folder. Uh, this is going to be the starting point that we're going to use for just about everything else related to the command line. There are other ways. Um, there's single user mode. By holding down command S on startup, you will access a command line only system, a root shell, um, but it does not load all services by default, so not everything will behave the way you expect it to. Don't rely on everything being present in single user mode. It's mostly used for file system checks, um, emergency password resets, or uh, adding new admin accounts. Uh, for example, if you boot in a single user mode and then you mount the hard drive, if you run this command up here on the screen, that uh, will trigger the very first time setup that Apple, go, that Apple computers go through when you first boot it up straight from, uh, straight from the factory. Uh, if you remember that from the setup process, it involves adding a new admin account. So this is probably the easiest way to get admin access on a machine as long as they don't have any kind of firmware password set. Um, I know, secure, right? There are lots of third-party terminal applications out there. Uh, just look on the App Store. iTerm seems to be the really popular one. Now, I myself have never once actually had to use a third-party terminal. Um, I haven't found anything I needed that they offered. Um, there are some that have some handy features. So it's, it's a personal preference. Look around and see what's out there. See if you like something better. Um, but I don't think they're necessary, per se. 
And then when it comes to remote access, SSH, of course, is the fastest and easiest way to access a, machi a machine's command line interface directly. SSH is generally much easier and faster to set up than any kind of screen-based sharing, like Apple screen sharing, Apple remote desktop, VNC, RDP, any other you know, tools like that. And most network admins are usually willing to open up the firewall for SSH, as opposed to port 5900 for VNC. We all tell users to read the manual. In this case, I'm not kidding. Read the manual. Um, the man command is probably the single most important command you'll ever use. It's literally the manual. It's the guidebook. It's the syntax information and the options available for the command that you need to use. Uh, the man pages contain a lot of good examples um, and lots of different permutations. And some of them go into great detail and can be quite lengthy. Unix commands, of course, have been around for a really long time, so they've all been very thoroughly documented. Um, there's not a whole lot that we need to know about Unix commands that isn't already in the man pages. The hardest part of searching for information about these commands is searching through all the information on these commands available on the internet. Like I said before, in many cases, if you need to know how to use something, someone else has probably already asked this on some question and answer form, and you can probably look it up pretty easily without having to do a whole lot of digging. Isn't the internet glorious? Now, Apple, of course, has a lot of Mac OS X only commands, a lot of unique commands, and these don't have 20 years of Unix history behind them. So some of them just aren't documented very well. Some of these commands uh, have uh, very confusing and not very beneficial documentation. Sometimes the man page just doesn't cut it, uh, and you need to turn to alternative resources. This is where mailing lists and IRC really come into play, because you can get real-time help on some of the commands that are, frankly, more obtuse in nature. Um, Apple, of course, tends to stick a lot of undocumented features. I know, I know, this is a huge shock to all of us. Everyone just take a deep breath, okay? When I first found out that Apple put in undocumented features and didn't tell anyone, I had trouble sleeping. It was really hard for me. Um, and especially realizing that they can disappear at any point. A single future update can wipe out a single undocumented feature that you've been coming to rely on. So be very flexible in your scripting if you intend to use these features because they're not permanent. If all you need is a quick syntax guide to how to run a command, the dash h or dash help argument will usually just get you a really brief primer on it. Um, if you need more details, of course, check the man page. All right, so people are already familiar with this a little bit, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail. Do people want me to go into detail about the shell? People okay with this? All right, we'll move on. I'll skip this and I'll skip this. All right, so I do wanna take a moment to talk about paths. Um, when you're developing scripts that you intend to be portable, and when I say portable, I mean you're running it on more than one machine, it's always a good idea to assume that the environmental variables will be different from what you expect, and you should plan accordingly. The path variable, in particular, is one that you should pay attention to. When you're logged in as a user, and you're running on the terminal, and you're testing out your scripts, everything's hunky-dory. You can predict what the environment's going to be like. You know how it's going to work. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but when you're running in situations outside of that, for example, Deploy Studio or other NetBoot situations, you may not have all the same stuff available. The path may not include everything that you expect. So if you're relying on programs that you assume to live in a certain place that's in the path, and that path is different, those commands will fail. Um, the idea that I'm trying to say here is that you really want to avoid ambiguity at all times. If you have to invoke a specific command that you need to run a specific way, specify the full path to it. For example, the diskutil command lives at slash usr slash sbin slash diskutil. If that's what you want to use, then it's a good idea whenever you're designing scripts that are going to run uh, in any kind of specialized environment, call the whole thing. Um, the, more you tr the more you try to assume, the more fun you're going to have debugging later. And everyone, everyone has fun debugging. Here's an example script that illustrates this. Can anyone tell me what this script does? Who wants to tell me what this does? Any guesses? I have prizes. Yeah, what you got? Fantastic, here. Enjoy your Snickers bar. Enjoy your other Snickers bar. All right, good work. Yeah, so this uses variables to assign the commands for disk util, and network setup. It explicitly states these locations in these variables. And then I eventually call them by invoking network setup and diskutil with the dollar sign, which if you are familiar with bash shell scripting is how you invoke a variable. 
The idea behind this script is that this way, all the commands I need to use are specified in the beginning. If I need to move this script to another environment for which the paths for disk util or network setup ever change, I only need to make one modification. I just need to change the variables. I don't need to change anything else in the script. Compare that to the same script done without the variables. In this case, I, I call each of those programs uh, by manually invoking them with their full path. Now, this example is nice and short, okay? It's not a big deal. Now, what if I had a script that was 100 times this length, 1,000 lines of this code, and I invoked these commands repeatedly? So that means if I ever needed to change the paths, I'd have to go through and change every single occurrence. That would get old real fast. Now, I know that there's text editors out there, and there's other commands like said you can use that can replace all occurrences in a file, but that's not really the point. The point is, it's better to make it easier for yourself from the beginning. So now that we've sort of gone over the commands, uh, the kind of commands that we want to use, what are the commands that we actually want to use in the terminal? First off, most importantly, we've got sudo. Okay, this is the way to get administrative privileges. Sudo allows you to execute commands at a root level. Note that you must be an admin account to use sudo. Uh, there's really no way to give a non-admin user admin access. Um, one way or another, you'll have to either give that account permission, either by adding it to the Etsy sudoers list, or you'll have to make it an admin account through the system preferences. Now note, if you do try using sudo as a non-admin user, uh, it will be really snarky and the terminal will tell you that this incident will be reported. You're not on the list. Um, and with anything involving root privileges, be careful. Okay, in the finder, if you delete the wrong file, you can hit Command Z, it all comes back. There's no Command Z in the terminal. If you use sudo and you do something catastrophic, you could be in trouble. If you complain about it on the internet, we'll mock you. All right, when you're using root access for anything, double check your commands. All right, so some more commands we might want to be interested in. Software update is a very basic but very helpful command. It does exactly what it sounds like. It's a manual check for software update. You can specify a catalog URL if you want to test out your Apple software update catalogs or your Reposado installation. Um, if you want to know more about those, there are other sessions on those topics. Of course, dash L for listing updates, dash I for installing them, dash I, dash A for getting everything. Note that unlike the GUI application, this does not automatically prompt you to restart. It tells you you should restart, but does not make you restart. So when you do apply updates, it's a good idea to reboot manually when you're done. System profiler, all right, this is of course the best way to get all the data you might need on your system. You can narrow down the list of data by using the list data types argument, which will, which will show you all the available things you might wanna consider. For example, if you just need a basic hardware report on CPU type, memory, serial number, the SP hardware data type will get you that. Um, there's a lot of data types, and of course, if you've ever run the system profiler, which I'm sure all of you have, there's a lot of data there. Uh, this is not cached data, it's generating it on demand. So if you run the full command, you may notice that it will take quite a while, especially if you have to build up a list of all installed applications. Uh, if you do want to make your own inventory collection script, it does support outputting to XML. All right, next up we've got the installer. Okay, this is the command line utility for installing packages. Um, it's very easy and a very fast way to install a whole directory full of packages at once. Um, it can be scripted and automated very well. So the first command here, who can tell me what it does? It's pretty straightforward. Come on, someone, what does it do? It installs something, great, you get a Snickers bar. There you go. Success. All right. And the second one, of course, just installs a directory full of packages to the, to, to the system drive. Um, there's one major downside to installer, and this is a really important one because it just came up recently. Um, this mostly applies to Apple packages, what's now being referred to as the Package Apocalypse 2012, okay? Apple signs all their packages with a certificate. This certificate expired a couple months ago for a very large number of their packages. Some of you who run Reposado uh, may have noticed this as well. Uh, the installer app that you run when you double click on a package in the finder just tells you that you have an expired certificate. The command line version does not. It does not let you get past this. If it runs into a expired cert, it will just fail. Um, so check out Greg Nagel's blog on information on how to deal with this. He has a really nice Python script that goes through the packages, tells you if they're expired or not, and strips away the certificate data uh, if necessary. Uh, note that doing this will change the hash checksum 
of a package. So if you rely on uh, any kind of specific hash for, for example, Insta DMG, uh, you'll need to properly account for this. All right, these are classic Unix programs, top and PS. Uh, top just gives you a list of all the, the heavy resource using programs. It's basically the same thing what you see when you open up the activity monitor uh, utility. The ps command for process is a great way to list all the running processes. Um, you, this is a great way to look for processes that may have gone off the deep end and, and zombified. Uh, it's a great way to mitigate some finder hangups. We've all, of course, experienced at one time in our lives trying to copy something in the finder or move a network share in the finder, and it gets stuck. And the finder sits there and stares at you and just makes you sad. We all hate those days. We all hate those moments. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can look through the process list for the one specific thing that got stuck, and you can try killing it. This doesn't always work, but it may save you a reboot or a logout in this case. Um, you can use PS to find specific processes. You can use PS space AUX WW to list all running processes not limited to the window width. By default, PS limits its output to the size of your terminal window. This is not very helpful. So WW, at the end of your command, will give it everything and just wrap around the text. Mount AFP, again, these commands are all pretty explanatory what, what they actually do. This allows you to mount AFP shares. First off, you need to make a target directory for it to go to, for example, volume slash share. Then once you've got that target directory in place, you can mount the share into it, and you can access it like anything else. All the, all the same rules apply for AFP. You can name things on it, delete things, copy things to it, whatever. Um, and then when you're done, you want to clean up after yourself. So just go ahead and unmount the share, and then delete the target directory, and everything's fine. Uh, note that depending on if there's a logged in user at the time, uh, depending on their finder settings, this may end up showing up on the desktop. So this won't necessarily be a secret operation, so just keep that in mind if you have any security concerns. Isn't there, a no browse? there is an option for no browse. Yeah, so there is one. SMB, SMB has a little bit different rules. Um, it's 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 a different. It's it's it, Apple didn't make the SMB rules, and again, also in Lion, it's different again because because why not? Because Apple. Um, I don't. I'm not mentioning it here specifically because in most cases, I find people prefer to use. Uh, well, they need to know more about AFP since it's less documented. SMB is very well documented online. Um, and again, like I said, Lion changes the rules a whole bunch, and I'm not a whole 100% up to date on that yet, so I don't want to give a slide on a topic that I'm not 100% certain on. All right, these are again classic Unix tools, change mod and change own. Uh, change own just lets you change ownership and group of a given file, and change mod changes access permissions. Um, so for example, this first command, uh, who can tell me what it does? It's really obvious. Anyone? Oh, shoot. Who gets this? Who's, who gets it first? You get it first. I saw you talking. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, so it just changes uh, any, this whatever file I have here to the nmixpad owner and the staff group. Um, the second command, can anyone tell me what it does? Very good. You already got one. You're cheating. Once per lifetime. All right. Who can tell me what the third one does? The plus W. Adds right permission. That's right. <laughs> Who can tell me what the zero, uh, the O minus X one does? Is that you? You said that. You said that. Here we go. Yeah, so there's different, you know, so change mod has both a written and numeric value, as we demonstrated here. Uh, it's worth learning both. Um, if you aren't familiar with this, the numeric form simply expresses all permissions as powers of two. Reading is worth four. Writing is worth two. Executing is worth one. And it, sum, it uses the sum of these digits to assign to owner, group, and then others. So you always get a three-digit number. The written system just is a little bit more readable, I think, um, and it just lets you specify user, group, or other, and adding or subtracting a given privilege. Anyone have any questions on this? All right, this is, like I said, this is a really well documented. This is an old Unix command, so this has been around for a while. So if you need to need a primer on this, just look online and you can find all kinds of things. LaunchD. LaunchD was introduced in Leopard and replaced all the old Unix style initialization scripts with XML plists. LaunchD is a complicated beast, uh, but it's really beneficial to learn. Uh, rather than using all these unique configuration scripts before, like etc, rc, init, 
Um, we now have a common XML format for all scheduled tasks. Without having to go into too much depth, because there are other sessions on this topic, and I really, really recommend them uh, if you want to know about how to schedule things in Mac OS X, LaunchD is a great Understanding LaunchD is a great way to understand how Mac OS X handles events in general. Um, and uh, the, mostly what we're going to want to do as Mac admins in general is we're going to want to look through the list of all the running system agents with the launch control command. Now, note that using sudo and not using sudo will actually get you different results. There's different user agents than there are system agents. So you will get different things if you use sudo or not. And uh, if you ever need to interact with it, the simple commands of uh, stop, unload, and load will let you interact with the system agents or user agents that are running. Like I said, this is a very complicated topic, and I'm not going to go into detail about it because it will go on forever if I do. Uh, it's really worth learning. For anybody who uses Apple Remote Desktop, Kickstart is going to be their new best friend. A ARD is a really helpful tool. And I consider it, personally, I consider it kind of a necessity if you're managing more than a couple dozen Macs. Um, it's it just for, for, for large quantities of Macs, especially remote ones, it is your new best friend. And it's also your worst enemy because it's really finicky. I think anybody who's ever used it has expressed some dismay that it just doesn't work as well as they'd like it to sometimes, but other times it's wonderful. And um, Kickstart is the command line way to configure the Apple Remote Desktop client settings. It's not in the normal path, so you can't invoke it by just, by just typing in Kickstart. You'll have to use the whole command to actually access it. It's buried deep inside the ARD agent in the core services. These two commands I've provided here, uh, together, both of them will con configure Kickstart to turn on for specified users, and then it will restart the ARD agent while giving the admin account complete access. So a lot of people will Excuse me, a lot of people who have an uh, ARD install would probably put something like this in their first boot script to make sure that all their clients are properly configured for the administrator access from ARD. Now, there's no man page for this because it's not really a system command. It belongs specifically to the ARD client. So you'll have to use the dash help in order to get information about all the different things you can do with it. It is pretty powerful. Just about anything you can do, uh, you can configure at ARD, can be configured through the kickstart command line. Network setup, what do you think it does? It sets up the network, I know, this is a huge shock. Um, this is the command line equivalent to pretty much the entire network pane of the system preferences. Uh, just about everything you can do in the system preferences can be done with the command line tool as well. Um, it's, it's, it's verbose, but the man page gives you all the information you'll ever need to know about this. So here's some sample commands. All right, who can tell me what the first one does? Who said that? Who said that, who gets credit? All right, you get credit. All right, who's next? All right, so what does the second command do? Join it joins a wireless network. All right, come see me when, when this is over and I'll just, I'll hand them off to you that way. All right, and the third command? Third command. It disables TCP over FireWire, right. Most people probably, most, most people I know in any kind of, administra in any kind of uh, enterprise environment generally don't use FireWire for networking. So in most cases, we just turn it off. Um, and, and lastly, of course, this is also another easy one. It turns off IPv6. If you're not using IPv6, don't necessarily need to have it running. So just go ahead and turn it off. There's an option for pretty much everything. Um, the network preferences, the network preferences of the, sorry, the network pane of the system preferences has a lot of hidden options. Uh, you know, control clicks and option clicks here and there will get you different results. And the command line utility kind of has all of that baked into one easy location. So it, I think it really pays off, especially when you're doing uh, first boot configurations to work with it. PM set uh, is the energy saver equivalent. This is what you'd normally find in the scheduled sleep settings, power, sa power management settings, and all that. All right, who can tell me what the first command does? If you had to take a stab at it. Okay, what does the dash B option refer to, if you had to take a guess? It applies to the battery, exactly. So this is a battery only setting. This will not change the settings for when a machine is plugged in. So if you apply this to a desktop, what do you think will happen? Nothing, Nothing. that's right. Um, and then of course, if you ever, and uh, the other aspect of energy saver is the scheduled operations. So we have here an example of a repeated shutdown every weekday at 7 p.m. Um, it's really handy to do it this way. I find that the interface uh, in the energy saver preferences just takes too long to get anything done. There's too many clicks involved. 
So I like typing things because it's faster. Uh, if you need to know information about the current settings, you can use PM set G to get a list of all your current power settings. Um, you can also specify specific things you want to know about. For example, PM set G sched, sketch, I'm not sure how exactly how we pronounce that. That will give you the current shutdown, wake up, startup schedule. Um, listing any of these things is, is free game, uh, but obviously making any changes requires administrator privileges. Now, anybody who does any kind of managed preferences or any kind of preference dealing with at all, um, default is going to be your next best friend. Um, and so is PLIST Buddy to a lesser extent. A lot of Apple, pro Apple products have preferences that are not available in the GUI. For example, Safari's debug menu. I know, like I said, we're all shocked that Apple puts in things they don't tell you about. This is a huge, a huge, you know, huge change for all of us. But default is the skeleton key that will unlock some of these otherwise closed doors. Uh, this primarily applies to Apple programs, but Adobe and Microsoft Office family of programs also have a lot of hidden keys that let you uh, specify options that otherwise you wouldn't be able to find. A lot of people, for example, will configure Microsoft Office to skip the first time boot up process or the setup assistant that it launches when a user first opens the program. If they've already provided that information, there's no reason to have all your users go through it when you're imaging machines. Um, defaults has a very uh, simple syntax. You read a plist and then a key, or you simply reading the entire plist will show you the entire contents of that plist, and then you write a value to a key to make the change. Um, sometimes it will require sudo, sometimes it won't. It depends on whether you're working on user space or system space. Plist Buddy uh, is a little bit more uh, comprehensive of a tool. It has an interactive shell unlike defaults. Defaults is a one, one command per line sort of tool. Plist Buddy opens up the ability to enter lots of commands at once and manage plists in a more comprehensive way. It's a, it's a bigger tool and it's a little bit more to learn. I recommend reading the man page on it if you want to know about it. It's not in the path. It's not a normal command you would normally find by just typing in plist buddy. You have to run it at user slash libexec slash plist buddy. Note the capitalization, it is important. Um, really though, if you're going to do anything really complicated, oh, I'm sorry, yes, question. I don't think so. I, I think I think now it's I, you know actually I'm not 100 percent sure on that. I think now it's built in um, because I remember doing it on a Snow Leopard client, but I could also be mistaken. I'm not 100 percent sure on that one. Um, plist Buddy is a little bit better than defaults for doing any kind of complicated plist operation. For example, if you're doing things like nested dictionaries in uh, in XML, um, but if you're going to go through that much effort and going to do that much modification of a, a complicated plist. It's one of those cases where maybe using a GUI tool like property list editor or a text editor might be a little bit easier. But just I want you to know that it's there and it's a pretty handy tool. Um, you can use uh, on this ex these examples sh these examples here show two different ways of using them. <coughs> can anyone tell me what the first command does? Right. It sets a specific catalog for the software update server. Okay. And can anyone tell me what the second command does? It just shows, yeah, it just shows the contents of that same plist. So these are, you know, two different ways of doing the same, th of similar things. Yes? Real quick question. Yeah. I understand that trying to read and write these down is, is difficult. Um, I believe these will be posted. I'm not 100% sure on that. If not, come see me and I will, I'll put it up somewhere for you guys if you want. Um, I'll make sure this is available because there are some good resources here and copying down URLs halfway through a presentation is never fun. Uh, believe me, I understand that. Um, so yeah, so plist buddy, as I showed here, the dash C argument allows you to execute a simple command on one line as opposed to opening up an interactive shell. Anybody have any questions on, on these two commands? All right. Uh, for print management, of course, users are always asking about printers and why the printers aren't working or aren't working as well as they'd like. All right? There are lots of scripts on the internet for managing and adding and remotely configuring printers. Uh, LP admin will be the command you'll want to use for adding new printers. LP options will give you the list of options that your driver allows you config to configure. And LP stat simply shows you the status of the print queues. Um, this is a generic command here, the LP admin command, for adding a HP LaserJet 4250. Um, and the second command here adds it as the default printer. Now, uh, the default printer just means that it's the next printer that will be set 
when the user tries to print. It does not actually change the default printer menu option in the system preferences. So that option is normally set to last printer used. Um, this does not change that. This only just sets the default printer for the user the first time. If they then print to a different printer after you've set this option and, it's, uh, and they have that default last printer used set, it will change the printer's default again. So just be aware that this does not change the visual preference you see when the user opens up the print and fax settings. Here is my printer adding script. Um, this again uses uh, variables to set all the information that you might need in the beginning and then simply adds it all in later. It's a nice modular script. Um, it allows me to easily tweak it so I can send this through ARD without having to rewrite the code. Um, by default, the PPD files are stored in library, printers, PPDs, contents, resources. Uh, this applies to 10.5 and above. 10.4 and 10.3 added some more to the path. They had an en.lproj uh, localization setting in there somewhere, so this won't necessarily work on 10.4 without some modification. And this is typically all I ever need to use for most network printers. Now, we've all struggled with the wonderful world of printer drivers and how easy and fun they are to play with. And in some cases, we've had to deal with obnoxiously aggressive printer drivers that require all kinds of crap to be installed on system startup. HP, Epson, I'm looking at you. Um, so this might not necessarily work for every single printer. And I've never tried this on anything USB. This is IP printing and LPR printing only. Um, but so far, in my experience, this has worked great for HP printers. Uh, um, is there something in here? Uh, no, this I don't have. I don't specify an option for duplexing here. There is an LP options command. If you do an LP options dash O, and you look at the printer specifically, you can see the options provided. The problem is that HP changed the duplexing option name. Uh, about a year ago for different for some models and some drivers. So I actually discovered that the same duplexing command that works on older printers does not work on some of the newer printers, but it does work on some of the newer printers. It's not consistent because because why not, right? Because HP, they just love us. Well, the, the other thing I've, I've noticed is that there's duplexing and then there's set to Yeah. You get to discover which one actually works right. because it's just not clear. Uh, I've, I usually try setting both and then hoping um, that usually, you know, goes for gold, and then someone eventually gets a two-sided page, and we're all happy. And sometimes they call it binding. Um, sometimes it's the really long two-edge binding collation option, which is in some models of the 4700 series of color printers. Um, the newer CP models don't have that same option. They separate it into four different options. So you'll have to spend a lot of time in the LP options command to find the one you're looking for. All I can suggest is experiment. That works too. I mean, if you want to customize a print driver, that's probably the, the most expedient method. Um, requires more setup in the beginning, but it probably has better payoff in the future. Um, I, I, I struggled with imaging my machines with specific printer drivers or not including specific printer drivers and ultimately decided it wasn't worth my time. I got so sick of trying to deal with that. I now just let my images have all the printer drivers and I'll just pick the ones I need and then they'll live with the extra 100 megabytes of space I'm using up. They won't miss it. If they do, they need bigger hard drives. Yes, yeah, uh, it, it applies mostly the same way. There's a little bit of tweaking you'll need to do, and that's documented pretty well online. Um, I recommend really heavily looking up, uh, <sighs> I think cryptid.com has a really good, list of, uh, really good list of scripts for printer management. Uh, if not, come talk to me later, and I can point you to some that I use as well for good resources on this. All right, so moving on, uh, back to Mac management in general. Okay, if you use any kind of managed preferences through work group manager, uh, the MCX commands will be really helpful. MCX query will just tell you what preferences are being managed by, uh, by managed preferences. MCX refresh will refresh the preferences and get a fresh batch from your uh, MCX provider. Note this only applies to work group manager provided MCX. This doesn't work on profiles. Um, profiles have their own little world of, of fun and joy, and uh, I haven't quite gotten all the way into those yet, but these commands apply mostly to Snow Leopard uh, server work group manager tools. Um, if you're using local MCX, uh, I don't know if any of you guys are, I'm, I'm a big fan of it myself. Uh, Alistair does have a session later on how to incorporate local MCX into your image. Um, MCX refresh becomes a really handy tool for making changes really fast to test them out because it sure beats having to reboot every time. 
All right, so when it comes to file system management, okay, we've got some other tools Apple provides. CP Mac and MV Mac, note the capitalization. Um, these are special copy and move commands that preserve uh, the extended attributes and metadata provided by the finder. Um, note that in, my, in many cases, the regular CP and MV commands provided by the Bash shell are sufficient. I haven't really had to use these two commands um, probably in years. I don't think I've had to use them since 10.3 or 10.4 maybe. Uh, but they're there, you know, so if, if you find yourself copying files and things are breaking, maybe you want to consider maybe the resource fork isn't coming along with it, especially if you're copying things across network shares or different file systems. Ditto is a lot like CP. It's, it's used to make exact copies of file directories or structures. Um, note that CP and Ditto have different behavior when copying directories. Ditto foo bar will copy the entire contents of the foo directory into the bar directory, whereas the equivalent CP command, cp-r foo bar, will copy foo itself into bar. So they're not interchangeable. CP and Ditto do behave differently, and it's important to know the details. The man page will have uh, a bit of a, a paragraph in there about how these differ and what kind of things you should be aware of. There's an example here of how to do a ditto uh, with uh, respecting the resource forks by using the dash RSRC argument. Um, if you ever use carbon copy cloner or super duper, uh, many of you probably have at some point in your lives, ditto is uh, the command that it uses to make all these copies. It uses ditto dash RSRC. If you ever look at the logs while it's running, you'll see this command show up a whole bunch of times. So when it comes to file system management, sometimes we just need to look for things or need to try and figure out what's actually happening at the moment. The fs usage command with sudo uh, will show you real-time file system activity. The interface is just, it just keeps throwing up every time a file is accessed, it adds it to the list and so it'll scroll past really quickly. But it's a really good way to try and figure out what files are actually being touched at any given moment. This is one way to track down those wayward installers that drop files all over the place. It's one way to figure out why this program you just copied from, uh, from another share or why some program that you deployed through Monkey or Casper or whatever isn't launching. It's looking for some file and it can't find it. Well, let's look at FS usage, see what's trying to do, figure out where to go from there. It's just a read-only tool. It just shows you what's happening and you can from there decide what you want to do with it. Okay, HDI utility is the first half of disk utility. It's the disk image handler of the disk utility program. Uh, I really, really want to say, read the man pages on this carefully. Anything involving disk utility um, is going to definitely involve a lot of information, and it's really a good idea to know ahead of time what you're getting into. Uh, it's a really handy way to... Uh, create, modify, open, and otherwise deal with disk images. Um, I don't use it too often in my daily life, but when I start doing repackaging or any kind of disk image management, this becomes a really, really helpful thing. Um, if you're setting up time machine sparse bundle backups on different file systems or network volumes, for example, uh, HDI util becomes a really helpful way to sort of figure out what kind of quotas are being set, how that sparse bundle is, is working. Um, Mounting a disk image can simply be done using the attach or mount. Uh, they're both synonymous in this particular case. And you can specify a number of different arguments that control how your disk image is actually open. Uh, in this particular case, this makes the volume open as read-only and it, and it uh, ignores all ownership on the volume. Um, HDI util create, convert, burn, you can pretty much figure out what these do, right? It creates images, it converts images from read only to read, write, uh, burn will burn it to media if media is active. Note that HDI util burn uh, will invoke the finder's equivalent of burning. So it will, if the user is logged in at the time, it will bug, it will bug the user for input. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, Lastly, it's important to note that the disk util command, which is the other half of disk utility, does something completely different. So make sure when you're trying to remember uh, how to use disk utility through the command line, these are very two different, very, two very different commands, and uh, HDI util only applies to disk images. Disk util applies to file systems. Okay, this is the other half of disk utility. This is the tool for handling actual disk and file configurations, uh, erasing, formatting, rating, etc., and so forth. Um, now, I generally don't recommend using disk util to change someone's file system in real time. Users tend to get kind of upset when their file system gets erased out of nowhere. And you're like, oops, sorry, I didn't realize you were on. Yeah, they don't want that. Um, 
I don't recommend using this remotely because it's generally a bad idea to play with someone's file system when you can't actually touch their computer because then you have to get in the car and drive over to their place and it just gets ugly from there. Um, so this first command, pretty straightforward. You can kind of guess what it does, right? It repairs permissions on the, tar on the system drive, yeah. Um, it, it does what you'd expect, although I find that it's not very verbose. Um, uh, last time I tried using it, it just sat there and performed the repair operation without actually giving me any output. That's not very helpful because then you just sit there staring at it for 45 minutes and nothing happens and you wonder if it actually fixed anything at all. There are ways to force it to give you output, but by default it won't. So just keep that in mind if you choose to use this. Uh, this second command is just an example of a way to erase a volume uh, located at some disk, replace it with a HFS plus formatted untitled HFS uh, volume. <laughs> It goes without saying that this is one of those things you should be really, really careful about. Um, this is your file system you're talking about. You are talking about physical drives. Before you press the enter key, it's a good idea to make sure you're targeting the correct drive. We've all gone to that one place in our lives where we've got a computer with multiple hard drives and we've erased the wrong one, or we've applied an operation or image, an op image the wrong disk. Avoid that, right? We, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna go there again. This is your file system we're talking about. There's no going back. So use this at your own risk. All right, so when it comes to incorporating other tools we have into the Mac admin command line library, okay, AppleScript is one of those things that no one really pays attention to until they have to, and then all of a sudden they realize it's really useful. It's really, really helpful. Uh, AppleScript is one of the easiest scripting languages to learn. Uh, it's pretty much readable even if you don't actually know AppleScript. Uh, it, it offers functionality that almost no one else does. Primarily, it allows you to touch things in the GUI. It allows you to press buttons and interact with dialog boxes in a way that most scripting languages just can't. Um, you can use OSA script to incorporate AppleScript into your other uh, scripts or functions. So this kind of gives you the best of both worlds. AppleScript does also allow you to make the computer talk to people. So it's always a good way to bug user, you know, by setting an OSA script say command and then, yeah, fun times. Um, if you need to plug a lengthy Apple script into a bash shell script, for example, you could use the syntax here, where uh, you just issue a whole bunch of large uh, instructions into this length between the end of my scripts, and then it'll plug the whole thing in at once. This is what I would do if I was using a ARD to send a Unix script to send an Apple script. I know it's kind of convoluted, but it actually works, trust me, and it's glorious. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's another way of doing it as well. I mean, there's a couple of different ways of approaching it. Um, if you're just going for straight, if you're just going for straight terminal terminal access, OSA script will do the same. Will, will do the trick. Um, if you do have, you know, the full system available, then yeah, Automator is a great way to incorporate shell scripts into it. Um, you can have a shell script that runs Apple script that runs Automator, which runs a shell script, which runs Apple script. You can keep going. I mean, it's a, it's a nice loop. Yeah, you can you can go as far as you want with it. Um, so you do have the flexibility to use all these tools at the same time. So this you know this is one of the nice things about being Mac Mac admins is that we get to use all these tools at the same time, and it works. It just works. This would be an example of uh, if this was in a shell script. So uh, assume that this would actually be in a full, this is, not, this is not something I would enter at the command line. OSA script dash E assumes it's a one liner. Yeah, so OSA script dash E say hello would simply just say hello to the user um, or something like that. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to incorporate more than one Apple script command into a single block of instructions, you could use a syntax like this in a bash script. So, for example, uh, if you need it, for example, I have a script that I use to log in a user who's at the login window. Um, it will correctly erase the contents of whatever's in the name and password field, populate it in the right order. Uh, that's all sitting in a giant OSA script block like this, which is then sent by a shell script through Apple Remote Desktop. If you, if you want any you know, ideas on that, you know, like I said, come see me afterwards and we can talk about uh, some tools for that. Any more questions on Apple script? All right. Now, account management, all right? DSCL is the key to managing accounts. Whether it's local or directory service-based accounts, DSCL is your gateway. Anything related to open directory, LDAP, or active directory will probably require some interaction with DSCL at some point in your life. So it's a good idea to learn about it. Um, 
in case of emergency with your AD or OD setup, if you can't log in, it's not authenticating, it's not binding, you just need to add a local admin account really quickly, DSCL will be the tool for this. Um, I'll show you an example script in the next slide for how to do this. There are scripts for this all over the place, so just do some Googling and you'll find some good results on this. Um, there are packages out there, uh, for example, create user and create lion user, uh, which add user accounts through payload free packages, which are basically, they just run a series of DSCL commands. Um, this example right here, the first one, simply just creates a new user. This doesn't do anything else. It doesn't set a, a user ID or a group membership or anything. It just adds the user to the list. So if you wanna actually have a user that's able to log in, there's a few more steps involved, and I'll get to that in a moment, okay? The second command just gives you a list of all the users in the system. Now when I say all users, I mean all the users. Every user that the system will use for anything will show up in this list. So if you want just to get a list of people who can actually log in, there's a few more tweaks you'll need to do. And that's all in the man pages. There are some examples in there. Um, hello. <laughs> Success. All right. Um, can anyone tell me what the dot does in the DSCL command? Just out of curiosity, does anybody, anybody have an idea what the dot refers to? Okay. Yeah, local. Okay, this means this applies to the local domain. So this means you're adding a new user to your local list of users. You're listing the current users on your local machine. If you want to specify a specific domain host, you would put it there instead of the dot. All right, similar on this similar topic, there's the create home dir, dir, uh, command. It does what you think it does, right? It, it simply creates the home directory for any user that doesn't have one. Um, so once an account has been generated and is in the local search path, you can use the create home dir command to uh, create the home directory for them. Uh, the man page has all the arguments you'll need. Dash C, in our previous example, we created a new user on the local system. Create home dir dash C would then give all local users a home path. Now, it's safe in that you're not gonna overwrite anyone's current home directory if you use this. It'll ignore any users that currently have a user specified at their home directory. This is an example script for how to add a new user through the command line. All right, so first off, we create the new user. We give it a unique ID. There's no easy way to determine a unique ID. Um, there, you know, you can do some commands with awk and, and, and grepping and figure out a unique ID that's not being used, but you need to make sure that the ID you specify is unique. It will not generate one for you automatically, so just be aware of that. Um, we've got the real name. Uh, the home directory, of course, is usually going to be in users. Uh, and then, of course, the primary group ID. If you want to make it an admin account, simply adding the group ID of 80 will automatically enroll it in admin membership. Um, once we have the, this information set up, we could just assign it a password, which again is optional. We don't have to assign it a password, but in general, we probably want to. And then once we've got this account created, create home dir dash C, we'll then go ahead and give you the users slash new user home directory and give it the correct permissions. I've tested this and it actually works out great. I learned about this command a couple weeks ago when I was blown away by how much effort this saved me. Oh my God, it's amazing. I wish I could marry it. Any questions on this? Yeah, this is a pretty handy script. Um, and like I said, there are packages out there that basically just run these commands, but this is the way to, to go for adding, a, adding accounts through the command line. All right, so the internets. There's a lot of different ways to interact with the outside world. Um, curl is simply a way to pull a file off a web server, a useful way of transferring uh, one to many. So you can post a file to a web server, send a command through ARD or whatever other remote management tools you have, and then you can have computers downloading all these files simultaneously rather than having to worry about a multicast copy operation. Dig uses your own DNS resolver to check IP addresses of a host name. It's uh, just a simple name resolution. Uh, note that Dig goes straight to your DNS setting. It will ignore the host's file and any other information you might have said about that. So if you do have any special DNS settings configured already, Dig ignores them. It just checks your DNS server for it. Um, host name does what you think it would do. It will give you the host name of the local machine. You can use the dash s command to set your host name. Note that Mac OS X stores computer names in a couple different places. There's different kinds of names for Mac OS X. There's the host name, the sharing name, and the computer name, for example. Changing the host name will not change the name that shows up in the sharing pane of the system preferences. It will not, sh it will not change the name that shows up when you first turn on the computer and you look at the login window. So just keep that in mind. 
And of course, the classic flushing the DNS cache, right? Especially if you're doing lots of DNS changes and you want to test out to make sure that your users are seeing the right things, flushing your cache is the best way to make sure you don't have any problems like that. Server admin, when you finally get to Snow Leopard or Lion Server, you'll finally have these wonderful tools of server admin available in the command line. Um, it might seem obvious, but these are server OS only. You will not find server admin in the command line availability for the client uh, OSs. But you can use server admin to send commands or re read and write settings to, the, to any given service itself. Server admin is just a wrapper. All it does is it gives you access to the services available in Snow Leopard server and uh, Lion server. Um, you'll need to use uh, you'll need to basically you need to use the uh, commands that I've listed here to see all the different variables you can actually modify. Uh, the man pages on server admin are very helpful and provide a number of good examples for how to get information about the number of connected users that AFP has or the current status of your web server, things like that. Um, there are a lot more commands than what the man page provides. The problem is that Apple doesn't do a very good job telling you what they are. Um, thankfully. I have done a little bit of digging, and I found these two links. And again, if you, if you can't read these or don't want to write these down, just come see me afterwards, and I'll make sure you guys can get this information if you want it. These are some, uh, some guides I found on Apple's website that contain a lot of information about server admin in particular. The first link uh, is, has a lot of useful data for managing Lion Server in general. And within each service listed in Lion Server, it has a list of all the server admin commands and settings that you can use to access this data. The, the services that are offered are, are comprehensive. I mean, all the, all the information available in these services is still available. Um, one of the big complaints that, that people had about Lion Server, for example, is that AFP won't tell you the number of users you have connected anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that information actually is present. Just the interface doesn't tell you. Um, but with server admin, you can find it. That information is there. Yes? Just want to mention really quickly, uh, the slides will be available. Groovy, thank you. All right, so the second uh, link I have here, it is for 10.5, but I did find that it has a very comprehensive single list of a whole bunch of commands that server admin applies to. Um, it seems to be the most comprehensive source. Now, of course, because it's 10.5, some things will have changed, some things will be gone, some things will be new. Uh, don't necessarily rely on it without testing first, but... Um, here are some examples uh, from AFP 548. You can use server admin as a simple way to back up and restore settings, either for your whole server admin configuration or for individual services. You simply uh, sudo server admin your settings into a backup file, and then you throw it back in when you're done. This is a great way for you to test out little experiments that having to do a complete and entire backup. Because doing a whole backup of your server, of course, you know, may take some time, take some effort. If all you want to do is one little tweak, this is an easy way to sort of find a starting point, test it out, see if it works, go back if it doesn't work. Um, I do not recommend, of course, doing major changes on a production server, but it's up to you guys what you want to do. That's, uh, that's it, that's all I got. Thanks for coming, I hope I was able to help. I have a lot more Snickers bars, so if you guys are hungry, just come by and I'll just give them out. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. No, this just it just applies to the server admin settings. That's all it does. It is literally anything that you can click in the server app or server admin dot app will show up here. So this doesn't do a server backup, it just does a settings configuration backup. Remember if, uh, when you first set up a server and it asks you after you've done your, your initial configuration if you want to save your settings somewhere? This is what it does. This is basically exactly what it does. Yeah? Ah, <laughs> the magic question. Most of it, I will say, afp548.com is a great resource, and uh, osxdeployment.com uh, is also a great resource. There's a wiki there for people who have learned these tricks and figured out the things that work really well and don't work well and posted about them there. And a lot of information that, you'll want, that you're looking for about undocumented features will be there, or the, the macOS Enterprise mailing list archives, also a great resource for it. Um, I recommend searching through those places first. And if nothing else, come to IRC. Come talk to us and we'll, we'll try and figure it out together. 
or we'll, we'll judge you and mock you mercilessly, one way or the other. Yeah, that's also a good one. MacOS10hints.com is also a good place just for random collections of uh, useful, useful ideas. You had a question? Yes, yes, you can turn things on and off with server admin, and then you can individually, uh, you can look at the variables and the settings that you can actually play with, uh, with the, I'm sorry, say again? Yeah, pretty much anything you can, you can touch in the interface of server admin for, or for Snow Leopard and then server.app for Lion is done through server admin as well. It's just a wrapper that gives you access to those commands. So if you do a server admin settings and a, list the name of the service, it will show you all the things you can actually see and touch. Um, and in nearly all cases, I find the command line equivalent to be more comprehensive than what most people think is a rather limited server.app for Lion. Um, so if, if you find yourself complaining about the interface for server uh, on Lion not being very good compared to Snow Leopard, this might give you more of the information that you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is a good way to, you know, that I recommend do this backup first yes. and, then, and, then, and then play with it and see what happens. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> it, that depends on the command. Um, if, if you run a command and you get no output, the command probably thinks it ran okay. Um, it, it just might mean it, it's looking for a little bit more uh, to actually give you some information to work with. So I recommend looking through the man page for it and seeing what the default of MailX actually does. It could just be that running the command uh, starts a daemon, which it will consider it a success if it starts it and then won't give you any output. So if you actually want to try and do something with it, you might need to check to make sure that the options you're providing will give it something that's actually going to spit back some information at you. Um, it will, if, it, if the command fails to run, Bash will tell you. Um, it, it, but if you just get no output and you just get back to the prompt, it means it thinks it did it right. Okay. Questions? All right, thank you guys. Thanks for coming. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your sessions. Come to my next one. I'm at 106 if you want to learn about scripting. I'm going to go into bash scripting in a little bit more detail. <laughs>